Canada's Cod Lunarn Island, Nunavut, on the southern inlet of Baffin Island's Frobisher Bay. Cod Lunarn just blends into the pack ice that freezes across the bay for most of the year. Cod Lunarn is not much bigger than a basketball arena. It's on the edge of the Arctic Circle above the tree line with no protection from the freezing Arctic weather. By late summer, the pack ice recedes, just enough for an aerial view to reveal a peculiar scar in the middle of the island. It's a perfectly straight gash, too square to be anything other than man-made. But this area is almost uninhabited, so what is it? In July 1993, a team of archaeologists and researchers find not one, but two trenches dug into the permafrost. The second is on the island's northern edge, cut from the beach onto the land. They're both about 80 feet long, 16 feet wide, and three to six feet deep. They're clearly the work of humans. Why are these large trenches dug seemingly at random into this tiny Arctic island? Around the world, we've seen similar giant pits as modern and ancient mass burial sites. Usually, they stem from wars or plagues or natural disasters. Could this island be the site of a mass grave? A mysterious trench dug into the middle of a desolate Arctic island may be the site of a long-lost mass grave. But as archaeologists dig, they find no human remains in the trenches. That rules out mass graves, so what else could they be? The archaeologists look more closely at the trenches for clues. They can see that the walls of the trench on the northern beach are carved cleanly away, with tool marks and scratches all over the rock face. As they dig into the permafrost, the researchers uncover some decomposed wood, dried peas, as well as the weathered remains of a wicker basket. It looks like this was some kind of camp. And analysis of the wicker basket reveals that it was made from reeds native to Europe. This basket's a long way from home. Inuit oral histories tell of large ships arriving in this bay hundreds of years ago. And Cod Lunarn Island got its name from the Inuktitut language, meaning white man's island. In the late 1600s, French and English trading posts were established across parts of what's now northern Canada. Is this camp evidence of a merchant ship or trading vessel that stopped for shelter or repairs? In the center of the island, just 100 feet from the first trench, the researchers uncover the remains of a small, rocky foundation wall. They can tell from the foundation that the walls supported a building about 12 by 14 feet. The shape of the wall looks nothing like local Inuit stone buildings. It looks more like a European cottage. But Codlinarn Island is so small and isolated that a European stone building here, it just doesn't make much sense. This doesn't seem like much of a permanent camp, so what was it used for? The researchers dig deeper and find their first major clues. Charcoal and the ceramic remains of a crucible. That says it all. A crucible is a cup used to melt rock, and you usually only do that when you're looking for metal. So the mysterious trenches were actually quarries. That explains the tool marks and scratches on the rock face. But what were they mining? The archaeologists uncover five beads of lead near the hut. The biggest bead is just slightly larger than a quarter. When you combine the lead beads with the crucibles and the charcoal, it's very likely evidence of an assay furnace, where precious metals like silver and gold are melted out of rock. The people who perform this task are known as assayers, a profession that goes back millennia. To assay rock, you heat it in a crucible until it's molten. Then you sprinkle in a little lead powder. The lead is like a magnet to precious metals, and they all pool together at the bottom of the crucible. 
Once they've cooled into beads, the precious metals are extracted from the lead. Someone on this island was mining for silver or gold. So who was it? In the summer of 1578, an Englishman named Martin Frobisher sails a small armada of 15 ships and 400 men through the ice-packed waters of the bay. He sets up camp on a small speck of land he calls Countess of Warwick Island and gets to work. Frobisher had been tapped directly by Queen Elizabeth I to bring back actual boatloads of Arctic gold. That's a lot of pressure, but Frobisher was well prepared to take on the challenge. As a young man, Frobisher was in and out of jail many times for, let's say, maritime misadventures. He was a state-sanctioned pirate, a swashbuckler, and a bit of a rogue. Over just two weeks in 1578, Frobisher's crew dug into the permafrost, pulling out ton after ton of the black rock they hoped was filled with gold. Frobisher built two assay huts to monitor the quality of his wares. After mining over 1,100 tons of ore, they packed up, sailed back home to extract the gold and present the massive prize to their queen. It was not an easy expedition. I mean, Frobisher lost two ships and dozens of men to bad storms, so it was a bit of a bittersweet return to England. But his luck got worse. In England, a sayer after a sayer found that his rock contained no traces of gold. Frobisher's rock was worthless. It's the opposite of what Frobisher's assayers had claimed, that Codlinarn would yield one pound of gold per ton of ore. Most gold operations are lucky to get a few ounces of gold per ton of ore. The archaeologists and researchers on Codlinarn want to know if the unlucky prospectors had simply extracted a bad batch of ore. Is Codlinarn Island still an untapped gold mine? They study their own samples of the Codlinarn rock using the same methods as Frobisher's crew 400 years ago. There's no gold. In fact, the rock is just amphibolite, and it's actually traces of pyrite and mica that give it that sparkly appearance. The most generous explanation is that his assayers had made a big mistake, and the queen had sent Frobisher on a fool's errand. Or was there something fishy going on? Was Frobisher just a dupe? Or did he and his assayers perpetrate one of the biggest financial frauds in history? 